Back in 1995, children's author Mick Inkpen wrote a most beautiful book called Nothing. It features a little creature, a stuffed toy, who lies in the attic alone and forgotten. The creature cannot even remember his own name, and then one day the removal company come and enter the attic to move the items there to a new location. But the creature gets left behind. What is that? asks one of the men. Oh, it's nothing, says the other. And the creature believes that that is its name. Nothing. Stuck in the attic, alone and forgotten, it's probably easy to think that you've got nothing, that you have nothing to hope for, and that you are nothing. In Nick Hornby's book, How to Be Good, Katie, a GP, and mother reads from 1 Corinthians 13. And when she comes to the bit that says, without love, I am nothing, she realizes that her lack of love has desensitized her and that she no longer feels anything. So she wonders what she can do to get that feeling back. In Life After God by Douglas Coupland, somebody else is thinking about the very same thing and he asks, is feeling nothing the inevitable end result of believing in nothing? And he ends up by saying that he needs God. I need God, he says, to help me love, as I seem beyond being able to love. In 2020, after the year that we've had, it is far too easy for people to believe that they've got nothing, that they have nothing to hope for, and that they are nothing. And the same is true of the church. We too can feel like the creature in Mick Inkpen's story, abandoned with other things from a bygone age, isolated and forgotten. Interestingly, the church is no stranger to that sense of being abandoned and isolated and forgotten. Back in the early decades of the 19th century, the church in this country was in a real mess. One writer notes baptisms and communions were neglected. In many churches, the font was filled with an accumulation of debris and the altar was a rickety table that served more often as a convenient place for the minister's overcoat, hat and riding whip than as God's board. The Bishop of London recorded that in 1800, there were only six communicants in St. Paul's Cathedral on Easter Day. Another writer adds, as to the parish clergy, it would not be difficult to find districts of England and Wales where drunkenness was very common among them, though such men were by no means in the majority. For the most part, it said, they were simply rather worldly men, with no high standard of clerical duty and only a commonplace view of the nature of their office. The bishops were wealthy as well as worldly. They held many preferments and often did not even live in their diocese. In 1832, Thomas Arnold, head teacher of rugby school, said, The church as it now stands, no human power can save. You know, it's too easy for the church to feel that it's got nothing that it has nothing to hope for, and that in many people's eyes it is nothing. So, what can we say to those who are overwhelmed with a sense of nothingness? Well, let's turn to our Gospel reading in which Jesus sees a great crowd who have followed him on foot. And it says Jesus has compassion for them. He ministers to them. And as evening comes, he tells his disciples to give them something to eat, but the disciples say, we have nothing. We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. This is a good example of what people call the deficit model. The focus is on what they lack. There are all these hungry people, but they do not have what is necessary. They have nothing. So you see, the solution to their problem, they think, lies beyond them. They can't do anything. They need someone to sort this out. But Jesus employs what uh, people call today an asset-based approach. 
he focuses on what the disciples actually have, five loaves and two small fish. Too often we focus on what we do not have and we fail to see the resources that God has given us. The Diocese of Chelmsford is huge. The Colchester Episcopal area has more churches than the whole of the Diocese of Birmingham, Bradford or Bristol. The Bradwell area has a greater population than the, than the Diocese of Salisbury. And the Barking area's population is twice as big as many dioceses. We probably have more licensed and authorised ministers in total than we have ever had in our history. And the amazing people of this diocese not only maintain and ensure their buildings, and together with their ministry teams plan, develop and extend the church's mission and ministry, but they also contribute around £17 million a year towards the cost of providing ministry in these parishes. We really should start with what we have and note what Jesus says. Bring them here to me. Last week we were reminded in the parable of the mustard seed how God can use tiny things to accomplish great things. That no work is too small if it's God's work. That no gift is too small if it's given in faith and love. That no act of service is too small if it's done to the glory of God. What we have to do is bring what we have to Jesus and say, look, I know in the grand scale of things it's not much, but it's all I have and so I give it to you. I place it in your hands to do with as you choose. Keep praying that prayer. Keep offering to God what you have. And you know, with just a handful of people, God could change the world. There could be an amazing revolution if we could just learn to focus on what we have and not on what we lack. And then offer what we have to God. You do not have nothing. And, and it's not true that you have nothing to hope for. Imagine what it was like for those disciples as they began to distribute the bread and the fish. They had to choose to believe. They had to entertain the possibility that God could make a difference. Imagine, imagine being that disciple looking at the thousands of people and then breaking off a piece of bread to give it to that first person. How much would you break off? But when you got to the 10th person, the 20th person, and you realise that the amount of bread that you have has not gone down, wouldn't that change your attitude? As a church, we need to believe. We need to believe that God can make a difference. That in the economy of God, our scarcity can be enough. That our scarcity can be more than enough. All too often, we look at the decline of our membership and the decay of our finances, and we draw a line, we extrapolate. And then we conclude, like Fraser in Dad's Army, that we're all doomed. One writer an American writer, says that to some extent we've all become apostles of continuity, extrapolation and derivation. But such a view of the future, he says, robs us of vitality because we believe that what we have is the only source of anything in the future. But what the Bible tells us, what the story of Elijah and the widow tells us, what the story of the wedding at Cana tells us, what the feeding of the 5,000 tells us, is that what we have is not the only source of anything in the future. For God can take what we have, however small and insignificant it is, and he can do something extraordinary with it. We need to have a change of mindset. We need to believe that God can make a difference. And that belief gives us all the grounds for the hope we need. Hope that, as a friend of mine once said, is not the same thing as optimism. Hope is active, she said. It goes out and it does. It falls and it fails sometimes, but it is tenacious and unafraid. And it survives long after optimism is dashed. Hope has confidence. It is awake. It will not let go of the notion that the good is real and that we can find it. Hope gives us a genuine sense of what we can be because of who God is. Hope is about believing in a God who takes a catering crisis at a wedding reception in Cana and delivers over a thousand bottles of the finest wine. Hope is about trusting in a God who takes a handful of fish sandwiches and feeds 5,000 people. Hope is about having faith in a God who takes our Good Fridays and all that pertains to death 
and turns them into Easter Sundays full of resurrection life. It is not about continuity, extrapolation and derivation. What we have now is not the only source of anything in the future. God is a God who does new things and that gives us that sense of what we can be because of who God is. It's not true that you've got nothing. What you have offered to God can change the world. And it's not true that you have nothing to hope for. What you have is not the only source of anything in the future. And knowing what God can do with what you have is all the grounds for hope that you need. And of course, it is not true that you are nothing. We always talk about this as the feeding of the 5,000. But this is what the reading actually says. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Oh, I see. It's the feeding of the 5,000 men. We just don't count the women and children. How many times do we do this? How many times do we overlook people because of their gender, or their age, or their ethnicity, or their sexual orientation? Oh, they're nothing, we say. Maybe not out loud, but by our actions and by our assumptions and by the way that we gear things up. But Jesus is not like that. Jesus does not overlook anyone. He made food sufficient enough to meet, feed all the people, men, women and children. As Paul said to the church in Colossae, in Christ there is no Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, free or slave. But Christ is all and is in all. Nobody gets overlooked. And you are not nobody. You are not nothing. In the end of Mick Inkpen's book, the little creature who had lain in the attic, alone and forgotten, ended up being dropped into the lap of the old man who had known him years before. And the little creature realised that he wasn't nothing. No, he was a small stuffed, stuffed toy who was called Little Toby. And most important of all, he was loved. You are not nothing. As Henry Nouwen said, all I want to say to you is you are the beloved. And all I hope is that you can hear these words as spoken to you with all the tenderness and force that love can hold. My only desire is to make these words reverberate in every corner of your being. You are the beloved. Anchored in this reality, our true self needs neither a muted trumpet to herald our arrival, nor a gaudy soapbox to rivet attention from others. We give glory to God simply by being ourselves. You are beloved. It's not true that you've got nothing. What you have offered to God can change the world. It's not true that you have nothing to hope for. What you have is not the only source of anything in the future. And knowing what God can do with what you have is all the grounds for hope that you need. And of course, it is not true that you are nothing. You are the beloved. Amen.